Club Cop defends the police's actions at the seawall. Canada making stringent efforts for catfish to be exported to USA. Barbies River Bridge may collapse due to low maintenance, says specialist engineer. Dr. Rukhnarine says it would be unwise for the WPA to leave the coalition. Those were the top headlines for the week ending March 23. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's weekend review, we tell you that Acting top cop David Ramnarine has defended the police's actions, which led to the demise of three alleged bandits last Thursday. The police claim the men were in the process of committing an armed robbery. Nickel John Du has more. Acting Commissioner of Police David Ramnarine says investigators who were working to crack the gang, who was targeting bank customers, would have collected intelligence over time. The Acting Commissioner of Police told me the operatives that based on their intelligence with support from the public those alleged bandits now deceased would have carried out the attack using potential deadly force the acting top cop also defended the lawman's action which led to the demise of the three suspected bandits the three guys who unfortunately because no police officer sets out to execute a citizen i have seen on social media and i've read in black and white language which says in very strong way that there was some semblance of execution but I will tell you the Guyana police force with the strides that we have made the capacity and capability building that we've done in the last years no officer sets out to execute anyone that officer is trained some are more highly trained than others there were a few who were utilized on that day in question who had superior firearms training than the average policeman. And I'm thankful that CID headquarters, in collaboration with another major department of the force, were quickly able to operationalize that information to the extent to where it ended. Ramnarine says Kwame Asana, who was also shot and killed during the shootout, may not have been a lawbreaker. However, he believes that the ranks of the force did not let the now deceased to be in the alleged bandit's vehicle. The acting top cop also warned social media users to be very careful with their statements as some are suggesting that the police killed the men wrongfully. The policemen acted in keeping with the law. They were fired upon and as law enforcement officers who are authorized to use deadly force as long as the deadly force is justified, as long as the deadly force is legitimate to defend themselves. Are the policemen, were those policemen in the situation they found themselves in expendable? Come on, let's be real. The acting commissioner of police said Asana was under the police's radar. He noted that a suspect who escaped during the shootout may retaliate against the Guyana police force. Based on the information we have, if we had not, I want to tell the citizens of this country, if the Guyana police force had not taken that course of action a few days ago, and that would have happened there, a lot of collateral damage would have happened on Rob Street based on the information we received. And it is good that it ended up at the seawall in a more desolate location. It is good. Also, I want to make the note that it is not the first time that persons who have left the bank would have ended up on the seawall and being robbed. It's not the first time. It's not a novelty that happened on the day in question. On Thursday, March 15, three men were shot and killed at the seawall. The Ghana police force in a statement said the men posed a security threat as they were trailing a bank customer. Following the shootout, a 9mm pistol along with a magazine containing seven live rounds and four spent shells were retrieved. In addition, the force claims that in the vehicle Asana was driving, ranks found one driver's license, 10 passports belonging to himself and family members, a key used by trunkers, two handcuff keys, a bandana and clothing. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update.
While the banning of the export of catfish to the U.S. is a temporary barrier, the Public Health Ministry claims brisk progress is being made to ensure the government becomes compliant to the regulations of the U.S. Changes are expected to be made to the Fisheries Act. Let's hear more. A decision was taken by the U.S. government to ensure consistency in food regulations to protect marine life. The coalition government has been informed of the changes in November 2015, more than 18 months before they were enforced. The extension was granted until February 3, 2018, to comply with the regulations, but to no avail, according to a statement from the U.S. Embassy. Guyana has not met the new standards associated with the new enforcement. Those regulations the government breached are providing inspectors insufficient documentation detailing verification of sanitation steps and on how the industry manages adulterated catfish. The new U.S. standards demands the presence of inspectors on the plants for one hour during an eight-hour shift. As such, the United States will not be accepting any catfish exported from Guyana. Former Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramsamy lambasted the government for the slow pace to become compliant. He says the fishing industry is unequivocally linked to export, therefore the government should act briskly to ensure the new standards are met. Ramsamy believes if the government cannot recover the American market, it will prove disastrous for fishermen and the industry. To ensure the government come in compliance, changes to the Fisheries Act and regulations will be taken shortly to the AG chambers. When this is completed, U.S. officials will conduct an audit of the local fisheries department to pave the way for Guyana to restart exporting catfish to the country. Firefighters were called in on Monday, March 19, to put out a blaze at the Guyana Power and Light Company. Find it more in this Nickel John the report. A vehicle which was parked in the compound of the Ghana Power and Light Company burst into flames this afternoon. The fire began just around 14 hours 30, just behind the building that once housed the generation sets that powered the national grid. Firefighters sprung into action to quickly contain the blaze with water and foam. Fire Chief Marlon Gentle, during an interview, commended his ranks for the quick response. He noted that had the firefighters not responded so quickly, the fire could have become uncontrollable. When they got here, they encountered a truck on fire, and the fire had already spread to a holding area that contained what appears to be bunker C fuel or some type of fuel. We were able to contain the fire using our firefighting resources as well as the in-house firefighting resources of the power company. So far we could see a truck was damaged and there are some pipes and other paraphernalia connected to the power generation facility that has been damaged. We have not been able to go through a full damage assessment as yet, but this is what we're seeing so far. We're still in firefighting mode because if you look behind me, there's a million gallons of fuel, high, high, high fuel that are used for the generators that is still under threat. We still have some cooling to do, it will take some while, a while and then we'll go into investigative mode. I think the response was very um, timely, and very robust at this time. We have been doing a lot of in-house exercises with the GPL and the Mara Power Company over the last two or three years, and definitely this was not a rehearsal, but we were able to do a proper response and a timely response to this facility. Right now, the danger is off. We just are keeping a fire watch and a cooling exercise going on. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Water resources must be shared among countries instead of having confrontation and conflict. That was the message President David Granger sent to his counterparts who are meeting in Brazil for the World Water Forum. Here's more from Nikhil John. Du. President David Granger addressed the World Water Forum that is being held in neighboring Brazil. The Guyanese head of state told the gathering that the world's fresh water supplies, unfortunately, are under threat. He noted that the growth of the world's population will increase the demand for water by 55% by the year 2050. That will further put a strain on fresh water reserves. 
President Granger said half of the world's people live in countries like Guyana and Brazil, which share river boundaries. He noted that the management of transboundary water courses must promote cooperation and collaboration rather than confrontation and conflict. The head of state also told the gathering that rivers must be protected from pollution, including that caused by environmental degradation and the discharge of waste matter from industry, mining and agriculture. President Granger said the adverse effects of climate change have exacerbated water quality and environmental security in Guyana. He stated that the countries which are part of the forum should be encouraged to continue to introduce initiatives to protect these resources, particularly the rivers of the Guyana Shield. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The life of the Burbies River Bridge may soon come to an end. Experts have calculated that poor management and maintenance may be the cause. Nikhil John, with the detail. Specialist engineer Bert Carter says a team of engineers have presented a detailed plan to the Burbies River Bridge Company to have a proper maintenance program for the bridge. Carter posited that the Burbies River Bridge Company may be holding back because of the high cost to maintain each pontoon. He also noted that in order for maintenance to take place, each of the 39 pontoons will have to float all the way to the Demerara River dry docks to be examined. Carter said for the cost of that exercise, over $2 million is needed for each pontoon to travel to the dry docks and return. The engineer was making a presentation at Murray House, located at Camp and Kwamina Street's Georgetown. Bring everyone back to Georgetown with a million dollars each or you create your own dry dock. No? It may be good. In this case, you have to see at least one, one million dollars back to Georgetown. Uh, I guess it will cost a lot more to build a dry dock uh, in Johnson down there. So, uh, right now, maybe invest, uh, well, I'm not saying who, but that's just a suggestion. The least cost suggestion to get an idea. I, I, I agree, I agree with you. The cheap cost is what kind of funeral you get. The specialist engineer went further to state that the Burbies River Bridge Company's maintenance crew is only focused on the structures above the water line. He noted that below the water line, there is no maintenance being carried out. That, he noted, is a worrying trend for the life of the bridge, given that since it was commissioned, there has been no maintenance. In 2015, when we judged the vicinity pontoon on the street, the idea was to be able to remove it and put it in the reserve pontoon. But then there they have, so the still just built up again. The truth of the matter is, exactly what Mr. Varniki has said is where we plan. Take out one pontoon, look at the situation, determine the rate of change. Because if it was in good health, you might do one every other month, as money came along. If it was in a bad way, you might have to do one every week, so to speak. The third nine pontoons can't be done in third nine days, you know. Because it takes about two weeks to get a pontoon in and out. And then when the tide is down your face, you can't really walk in the night. It's quite a nightmare when you think about it, but you know, you're not speaking to anybody who's really to listen. President of the Burbies Chamber of Commerce and Development Association, Ryan Alexander, also expressed grave disappointment with the bridge company. He noted that the management of the bridge has held several meetings with the officials in the region. However, this matter was not on their agenda. I seldomly see them at meetings. They have not raised this concern with, this, with the, the Borbishian of Commerce and Development Association. I am also a part of the Private Sector Commission, of which they are a part of also. And I have not heard anything at the Private Sector Commission to this nature of the seriousness as it pertains to the maintenance of the Borbis uh, River Bridge and the type of problems that it will pose the bridge was officially opened on December 23, 2008 by former President Bar Jagdio. The structure links regions 5 and 6, giving residents of the two regions easy access to cross the river. Before the bridge was constructed, everyone had to use the ferry service between Rosignol and New Amsterdam. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. As the Public Health Ministry intends to protect citizens from the abuse and misuse of medications, regulation will be upgraded for the pharmaceutical industry. So says Chief Medical Officer Dr. Shamdir Prasad. Let's hear more. 
Through the Ministry of Public Health, laws, acts, regulation and policies are expected to be upgraded to guide the pharmaceutical industry. This follows the wide use of antibiotic, the existence of illegal pharmacies and other irregularities listed by patients. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Shamdia Prasad says there has over time been a challenge in monitoring the industry. As such, measures will be put in place to ensure the population is protected from the abuse and misuse of medications. Um, the global challenge includes the wide range of uh, production sites that are there in various settings, the range of products that are produced, which varies from um, simple cosmetic type um, interventions, but can be deemed as treatment or can have detrimental effect if they are not used correctly. And the whole issue of the um, movement of pharmaceutical, including the illicit movements across borders. Another worrying issue is the movement of medication, which will be stringently pursued, especially at the borders. He also believes non-traditional medicines should be addressed to ensure quality assurance. According to him, the ministry has engaged the Caricom Commission on Marijuana to peruse the medical benefits of the substance. This, this aspect of, um, of drug control has actually taken a turn for maybe not such a good reason, but um, in many other developed countries there are provisions now for recreational use of some of these substances. Um, we're not sure if we're ready for that. We're not sure if um, and we still, the, you know, the verdict is still out and discussion is still going on. The pharmaceutical and medicine policy is expected to be reviewed by a team spearheaded by the World Health Organization and the Public Health Ministry. As social workers continue to fight for human rights and social justice to strengthen communities, they were charged to demonstrate professionalism. This message was given to them on March 20th, celebrated as World Social Work Day. Find out more in this report. March 20th every year is celebrated as World Social Work Day. The day brings together social workers from across the globe to celebrate the numerous achievements in their profession. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Social Protection, Lauren Baird, charged the social workers to undertake their profession with dedication. She urged that they be resilient to ensure vulnerable persons in society are counseled. I would like to encourage social workers to be resilient and to continue to strive for the change you want to see as you endeavor to improve the well-being of our society and the country as a whole. I encourage you to be proud of your profession and to continue to undertake your commitments with passion and dedication. President of the Ghana Association of Professional Social Workers, Arnold Mickle, is paved as he claimed social workers do not see themselves as professionals. So those who have gone before, those who have graced the association with their presence and have contributed, the doors are still open. You have not outgrown the profession. You need to come back that we can have a, an association that is highly professional with all the highly skilled professional persons we have in our society. So my appeal is to have all of you to come back home. With about 1 million graduates from the University of Guyana, just about 20 is said to be actively involved in the association. The Social Protection Ministry, in appreciation of their work, presented awards to long-standing social workers. One executive member of the Working People's Alliance has urged his party to leave the coalition following the sacking of two columnists from the Guyana Chronicle. However, another executive member of the WPA, Dr. Rupert Rupdarine, believes it would be unwise for his party to leave. Yannis Abrams has more. Over the weekend, executive member of the WPA, Takoma Ogensei, had stated his party members should consider leaving the coalition party. His statement comes after two columnists were asked to discontinue their weekly publications in the Guyana Chronicle. Lincoln Lewis and Dr. David Hines are said to have been writing editorials for the past two and a half years. 
However, another executive member of the WPA, Dr. Rupert Rupnirain, believes it would be unwise for the WPA to leave the Partnership for National Unity Party. He said it is a serious matter which needs to be discussed thoroughly. I can tell you from the start that they would have a lot a hard time convincing me that this was a good idea. Um, I think that the coalition, you know, with all of its difficulties, is the way, the way forward for us. I don't believe that, um, you know, any single individual party can do, really accomplish the tasks that are ahead of us. And I think that our best bet um, as a party is to work more closely, more harmoniously within the, within the coalition. The Minister of Public Service claims that an issue that has been present is resources within the party. Dr. Rupnerain stated the WPA membership had started with visiting persons at their homes and hosting bottom house meetings, which he believes need to be revived. And we would need to do this throughout the regions. It's, it's a big challenge, but I think it's the work that needs to be done because if you're going to reinvigorate the party, then I think you need to bring more and more working people into, into, the, into the party and to resuscitate the party groups in the various villages and areas and so on. And this is, this is the, the, the real task ahead of us. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yaris Abrams. After the charge of sexual assault was dismissed from against Carl Parker, he has been reinstated as Regional Executive Officer of Region 9. However, the council is against him continuing that capacity. Let's hear more. Carl Parker has been given the green light by Minister of Communities to resume his duties as Regional Executive Officer of Region 9 on March 12, 2018. This follows the dismissal of a sexual assault case which was levied against him in February last year. So says Chairman of the Region, Brian Alicock. Parker was temporarily sacked of his duties after allegations of sexual assault surfaced against him by an elected representative of the Region. He was placed on $200,000 bail as a result of the said allegations prior to him being freed of the charge. However, residents in the region are peeved with Parker's reappointment. I think um, the government have blundered in, in, in a way that um, they should not have done that. Um, a lot of people agree that they should not have done that, but um, they know what they're doing. So, yeah, but I, I, you know, I wrote letters to the president, and so um, they're looking at it at, from that end. During his absence, Kevin Ward, formerly of Region 3 RDC, was appointed on February 20, 2017, as his replacement. With him resuming his duties, Ward will function in the capacity of Deputy Regional Executive Officer. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The Ghana Water Incorporated is seeking to partner with the local democratic organs to identify areas where fire hydrants can be erected. This will assist the fire service to out more fires, saving lives and immaterial possessions of persons. Find out more in this report. Managing Director of the Ghana Water Incorporated, Dr. Vanus Charles, during a recent press conference said, the company is looking to have all fire hydrants up and working. The utility company's managing director also said that the issue of erecting fire hydrants and maintaining them is not a one-agency mandate. Dr. Van West Charles stated that GWI has been making recommendations to the neighborhood democratic councils to have fire hydrants in their respective communities. The responsibility of rehabbing and um, this is one of the things that we had a discussion with with the NDCs to see that in some of these NDCs where there are no hydrants that may be in their budget going forward, they can begin to consider the cost of hydrants in the varying communities. The managing director also posited that the towns which were established recently can also follow suit. In the new towns example, for example, that um, in those new towns that we begin to map out the number of hydrants that are needed and that collectively we find the resources to, to address it because it's a security issue. 
In recent months, there have been several fires in Georgetown and outlying areas. Those fires have left dozens of persons homeless while destroying most of their material possessions. Nikhil Jonder reporting for MTV News Update. President Granger during his address to the 24th Organization of American States urged all members to collaborate to ensure the tourism sector thrives in an economic fortune for each member state. The Shanagom screening is files of support. The inauguration of the 24th Inter-American Congress of Ministers and High Authorities of Tourism was earlier on Wednesday at the Marriott Hotel, brought to fruition under the team Connecting the Americas Through Sustainable Tourism. The OAS Congress has been hosted in Guyana for the first time since the English South American state has been a sterling and contributing member of the OAS. The two-day event is said to be a major forum where representing ministers from American member states will discuss diverse aspects aspects of tourism, its role as an economy builder, how to enhance the sector entirely, and most importantly, how integral it is that each member state work collectively to further develop each other's tourism industry. President David Granger, during his opening remarks, stressed extensively on the importance and benefits of sustainable tourism. While tourism within American states has over the years been experiencing several hiccups, the president noted to enhance the sector, more efforts on the part of member states and the private sector needs to be taken. The Americans must protect and preserve these priceless assets for the benefit of the present and future generations. The Americas, despite their just world of independence and two civil wars here and there, are the atmosphere of relative peace in today's turbulent world. The promotion of sustainable tourism initiatives and the marketing of the Americas as a zone of peace in a world with so many wars and conflicts should be subjects for consideration at this Congress. The protection of the America's patrimony, its natural assets, its cultural diversity, and this blissful state of peace is the bedrock of sustainable tourism. The tourism industry must be protected from the perils of transnational threats such as cybercrime and trafficking in drugs, trafficking in guns, and trafficking in people. Security cooperation against transnational threats will make our society safer for our citizens and for visitors. Executive Secretary for Integral Development of the Organization of American States, Kim Osborne, informed the gathering that traveling tourism, like other forms of tourism, is quite an important aspect of OAS economies. Osborne explained that the OAS is continuously working to develop the tourism sector within the region. Tourism is a very important activity for the economies of the member states of the OAS, and for many of them, it's the principal source of direct foreign investment. Employment and the largest central of GDP. It is critical, therefore, that all tourism policies, programs, products, experiences, and marketing well-defined and targeting is we are to build resilient communities and countries. In this way, we will project to the outside world the seriousness of our community. Day two of the 20-foot Inter-American Congress of Ministers and High-Level Authorities in Tourism will convene on Thursday at the Marriott Hotel. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Government pathologist Dr. Nihal Singh has denied ever being present at the Lindo Creek crime scene. His statement follows that of Commissioner of Police, Elad Brasad, who claimed during his testimony to Commission that Dr. Singh was at the scene. Yana Sabrams with the details. According to government pathologist Dr. Nihal Singh, he did not perform any post-mortem on the eight dead minors. During his testimony at the Lindo Creek inquiry into the killing of the eight men, Dr. Singh stated he was scheduled to conduct a post-mortem on the eight men on June 23, 2008. However, Dr. Singh claimed that he never reached the scene of the crime as the terrain was rugged. 
He, along with senior officers, stayed at the camp whilst the others ventured to the crime scene. However, Commissioner of Police Hilal Pasad had claimed that Dr. Singh was at the location. Can you say who would have conducted that post-mortem report and where is that report? I am not sure. Might have been um, Dr. Nihal Singh. He was at the scene as well. And the report should have been in the Bible. According to the pathologist, he was informed by the media on June 22 that the bodies were brought to Georgetown. Put it this way, on Monday I was at home uh, looking at the news and I heard that they had brought all the bones out. Uh, I said, good for them, thanks. Let's work for me. Then on Thursday, uh, the week, the same week, I got a call from the then Commission of Police, Mr. Green, and he said to me that, um, Dr. Singh, that the government is going to fly in a team from Jamaica with um, the pathologists and the crime scene people. I said to him, well, I'm not going to be absorbing anybody. I mean, I got work to do. Let them do their job. And that was it on Thursday. On the following Tuesday, the next week, uh, I was in my office and the secretary came and said, there's some people looking for you. I said, who are they? He said, no, they, they said they're from Jamaica. I realized it might have been the team. They came in and we had a discussion and I told them, okay, let's go downstairs. This is the mortuary and you have the staff. You get to work. I'm gone. And I left. The pathologist mentioned that the late commissioner of police, Henry Green, had told him a team from Jamaica was in the country to conduct a autopsy on the bodies. He re-emphasized that he did not conduct any post-mortem on the bodies. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Predicting a victory for the People's Progressive Party in the 2020 elections, the party's General Secretary, Bharat Jagdir, promises to resolve the petroleum agreement amicably. Let's hear more. When the PPP gains victory in the 2020 elections, the party will be working to resolve the controversial petroleum contract amicably, says General Secretary of the PPP, Bar Jagdiu. Jagdiu has also made it categorically clear that the PPP will include the opposition in their engagements. Um, we, I said, well, it, after the elections and if the PPP or when the PPP emerges vic victorious, that we intend to involve them in this sector, uh, particularly in, in the oil and gas sector, because it's a, I've seen how countries with a large amount of oil resources that export millions of barrels per day because they treated the sector in a political fashion, that those countries never reap the benefits, the potential benefits. He was at the time lambasting the government for what he termed as a horrible approach in managing the country resources. Jack Duke claimed that the government failed to include civil society and the PPP in their engagements. He further bashed the government for not implementing the advice given to them from officials in the oil and gas sector. Jack the Afforda guaranteed that the government will not implement any advice from those officials as they have not done so in the past. He believes it is a mere facade by the government to demonstrate work in progress. Supporting the call for a view of the Cummingsbird Accord is executive member of the Working People's Alliance, Dr. Rupert Rupnarine. He says it would help the coalition to pinpoint the areas they have fallen short in. Yannis Abrams has that story. According to executive member of the Working People's Alliance, Dr. Rupert Rupnarine, a review of the Cummingsburg Accord would be helpful for the Partnership for National Unity Alliance for Change Coalition Party. Dr. Rupnarine, who is also the Minister of Public Service, stated that he does not think there is any crisis for the Cummingsburg Accord to be critically reviewed. Further, he claims nothing is planned or fixed for a review currently. But I think it's a good idea with matters like this as time goes by when we 
when we formulated the accord, there were certain things in the environment. Some of those things have changed, and there's no reason why the Cummings I mean, it's not, you know, it's not biblical. We can certainly go to it and look at it again and see whether or not it's doing what we expected it to do. And if it hasn't, then we should review it and amend it and do what is necessary. When News Update asks the Minister of Public Service if he believes membership of the APNU AFC still stands the same as previous years, he stated the only way the party would know if there is a poll, which Guyana does not have. I mean, we need to go down among the communities and see what kind of response we get, what kind of criticisms we get. Um, you know, I think the only way to re-energize the coalition is, in fact, to re-energize it from the communities up. And, uh, you know, the sooner we can get down to going among the people and, you know, restoring the energies of the coalition, the better. The Cummingsburg Accord was signed by the Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change on February 14, 2015. This paved the way for the parties to contest in the 2015 general and regional elections as a single party, which eventually unseated the PPP party from governance after 23 years. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, March 26 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.